Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins and rose again the third day. My name is Brother Ed, and I'd like to welcome you to KJV Bible Scope, and we are on a series of the Book of John, Part 48. Part 48 of the Book of John series, and we are in the subheading of Under the Fig Tree. Under the Fig Tree. We are in the account of Nathaniel. Um, as we're in the book of John chapter 1. And as we're reading the Bible verse by verse and doing expository teaching verse by verse throughout the Bible, uh, especially in this book of John here, um, we are noticing some very helpful and practical things we can use and understand in our lives, as well as getting the historical context of the Bible so you can have a deeper understanding of the Word of God, showing there is no contradictions in the Bible, as many would assume, and the fact with a little bit of understanding, um, it may bring many to the knowledge of the truth to even believe and trust in the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, let's go to John, and we're going to start in verse, or chapter 1, we'll start in verse 43. Now, let's go to the Bible here and just read it, and we'll get to our verse in uh, verse 48 to do our expository teaching. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, Follow me. Now, Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith, saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So what we're doing, we're getting the account of when Philip uh, called Nathaniel and told Nathaniel to, uh, he testified to Nathaniel of Jesus of Nazareth, you know, talking about Jesus as if he was the one that had fulfilled the Old Testament law and the prophets in verse 45. But we are in verse 48, and we're going to ask the question here. What does a study of other references to fig trees in the gospel tell us about the Lord's strange conversation with Nathaniel? You guys see that? I mean, we got this fig tree thing here going on. You guys remember that? And then um, look right here in verse 48. Nathaniel says, saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. See, something happened within Nathaniel in that little situation with the fig tree that right away Nathaniel responded in a positive light and actually assuming Jesus Christ to be the very son of God, uh, the king of Israel. And he actually gets the order right in verse 49. He calls him rabbi. Thou art the son of God, thou art the king of Israel. Now, we're not in verse 49 yet, but we will get there. and We'll talk about, you know, uh, Nathaniel uh, professing uh, these truths about Jesus Christ. But for now, let's talk a little bit about this fig tree right here. I mean, we asked the question, um, what does a study of other references to fig trees in the gospel tell us about the Lord's strange conversation with Nathaniel? Now, 
I would say, you know, in the Gospels, right, in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we would, we would do a study on fig trees, and what does Jesus say about the fig tree in the Gospels, or what does the actual, you know, the accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John state about the fig trees? But I contend, I'm just, I'm going to kind of lump some a little bit up in the Old Testament, and we'll kind of make some comments about the New Testament. Now, watch this. The fig tree in the Old Testament, represents the nation of Israel and the physical kingdom of heaven, and also represents prosperity and peace with a typology of the millennial reign of Christ. Okay, that's the Old Testament. And we find that theme going throughout the New Testament. But then as you get progressively through the Bible, you see there's a spiritual situation going on with Israel, right? And they've always been struggling spiritually throughout the Bible. Now, but in the New Testament, in Luke 13, 6 to 7, now let's, let's keep our place there in John 1, 48. Now go to Luke 13, 6 to 7. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if and if, if it bear fruit... Well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. So, here we have a truth about the, come on, about the fig tree. Remember, we, we, we're talking about this fig tree, right? And concerning this fig tree, we see that it's dealing with the spiritual condition of the nation of Israel. Look, Jesus, uh, let's just say this, there is no fruit on the fig tree right now. Let's just say that. that and, and we're dealing with no fruit on the fig tree. All figs should be, all fig trees should be bearing fruit. It should be bearing figs. But according to the nation of Israel, they're not bearing any figs. They're not bearing any fruit right now. And in Mark eleven eighteen to 21, Jesus had cursed the fig tree because it had no fruit and it withered away and was dried up from the roots. This is the nation of Israel's spiritual condition. Look at Mark eleven eighteen to 21. And the scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him. For they feared him because all the people was astonished at his doctrine. And when even, and when even was come, he went out of the city. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. That fig tree, my friend, is, is the, the, the spiritual condition of the nation of Israel. They're not bearing any fruit at the time of Jesus Christ. There was only a few people, I mean, in every dispensation of time throughout history, there's always been a few Israelites that did respond by grace through faith in what God has revealed to them. That's why you had prophets, and these prophets would preach to the people, and then the people as a bulk, as a whole nation, would reject God and serve other idols, um, constantly serving other gods, constantly turning their backs on God. The spiritual condition of the nation of Israel in the time of Jesus was no different and it wasn't bearing any fruit and so you see the fig tree uh, representing the spiritual condition of the nation of Israel now that's uh, Matthew 13 uh, 28 we have another reference there and in Matthew 13 28 when the fig tree is tender and putteth forth leaves is likened unto the second coming of Jesus Christ's return. When Jesus tells Nathanael, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. This could be what Philip was discussing under the fig tree with the Lord, and the result of that prayer was what Jesus told him in John 147. Remember that? Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Right. And then, look, look. He says that, and then look at verse 48. Nathanael say, saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that, Philip, called thee. 
when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Do you think that maybe verse 47 and verse 48 could be interlinked as far as the truth of verse 48? Because right away, Jesus says this, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. And if you look a little bit back here, this is where Nathaniel says in verse 46, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? And then Philip is beckoning him to come and see. So do you think that maybe Jesus heard when uh, Nathaniel said that? Of course he heard it. Jesus is God. But then Jesus makes the comment before um, Nathaniel or Nathaniel is told by Philip to come and look at verse 47. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him and saith to him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. And right away, Nathaniel's like, wait, well, why, why is Jesus talking to me like that? You know, how, how do you know me? How, how do you know me, Jesus? And then Jesus, Jesus uh, talks about something right here in verse 48 that obviously when you read verse 49 and, and, and 50, you start saying, wait a minute, there is something more going on here than just Jesus seeing him underneath the fig tree. Maybe Jesus, uh, you know, him being under that fig tree, something was going on that he wasn't really supposed to be seen under that fig tree or that nobody saw him under that fig tree. Who knows what it could be? We don't know. We can just speculate. That's all we can do. But certainly something miraculous happened because when you go to verse 49, Nathaniel answered and said unto him, look what he, look, he changes his mind. First he went from, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Come on. Jesus Christ was standing right there. Philip was like, come and see. And then look, look, something changed after Jesus said, I saw you under the fig tree. He calls him rabbi. He said, thou art the son of God. Thou art the king of Israel. Wow, that's three proclaimed truths about the Lord Jesus Christ. And, we're, and again, we're not going to get into John 149 yet. Uh, that's going to come up in our, in our next uh, broadcast. But um, certainly... We are in verse 48. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? So how do you know me, Jesus? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee. For Philip went over to tell you, Come and see. When thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Now, come on. We're talking about the significance of the fig tree concerning uh, how it's represented in the gospel and, and how this strange conversation between Nathaniel and Jesus kind of unfolded. So if in John 150, in John 150, Jesus answered and said unto him, because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And look, look, look. We're, again, I don't want to blow this wide open because we still got two more sermons um, on this, at least two more sermons, possibly three. And I don't want to blow the sermon wide open right here, okay? So I'm going to be very careful how we handle these two verses because uh, I've got some great truth to deliver to you uh, according to these two last two verses of John 1. Um, look at verse 51. It says, And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now, there is something greater than being seen under a fig tree. Right? Isn't that what Jesus is saying? There is something greater than being seen under a fig tree. No matter how miraculous it was. Here's a practical note. There is something greater than being part of the nation of Israel as a typology or the fig tree was a typology of Israel all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. The fig tree represents Israel. So there is something greater than being under the nation of Israel, being part of the nation of Israel and being the fruit of that nation. The greater things are mentioned in the next verse. And we're not, we're not going to go into that. I, I just want to, I want to just you know, put you on the edge of your chair. We're about to get, you know, in the next two broadcasts, we're going to get some really neat things. Okay. And uh, so let's go ahead and uh, continue on here in verse 49. Now look at verse 49. Nathaniel answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the son of God. Thou art the king of Israel. So Jesus, the lamb of God is mentioned 
right there in John chapter one. So if we're talking about the names and titles by which Jesus is identified in John chapter one, we have Jesus, the Lamb of God. We have Rabbi, we have Messiah. We have Jesus of Nazareth. We have son of Joseph. We have son of God. We have King of Israel and we have the son of man. All those are mentioned in John one. So what is the importance of the combination of the three titles given him by Nathaniel in John 149? What we got highlighted right here in blue. Remember, he calls him rabbi. So rabbi refers to his personal position in Nathaniel's life. He's teacher in Nathaniel's life. He's a rabbi. The son of God is Jesus' position in heaven. When he, be, when he bore that body of flesh, when the eternal word incarnated that body of flesh, that body that was prepared for him in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, he became the son of God. So it refers to his position in heaven as the son of God. Okay. Now look at king of Israel. Thou art the king of Israel refers to his position in the physical nation of Israel as their king. Okay? So we've got three combinations of titles given him by Nathaniel, and all of them have a truth and side of portrayal in the practical life of Nathaniel. Now I want to ask you today, Jesus Christ is more than a rabbi to us. We're not even Jewish. But still, we are taught by Jesus in the Bible. But he's more than just the son of God, just somebody that came uh, in a body of flesh to just be on this earth to be the son of God. He's more than the son of God. He's God. He's more than this. Than, than, come on. He's more than just some man that was on this earth, some rabbi. He's more to us than just the king of Israel. Who is Jesus Christ to us? He's the son of God. He's the son of man. He's the savior. He's God. And for us, he's the king of kings and Lord of lords. See, a little different view there than we had of Nathaniel, but nevertheless, look at the progression here. This is absolutely right. Uh, Jesus Christ was rabbi, son of God, and king of Israel. So what is the difference between Christ being the Son of God and the Son of Man? Now, that's uh, verse 49. See, you got Son of God right there. And if you go to verse 51, you've got the Son of Man. Why the differences in the wording there? Son of God showing he is fully God. Nathaniel answering Jesus according to what Jesus told him. Only God could have known that, right? When he saw him under the fig tree, according to Nathaniel, he's saying, wait a minute, only God could have known what, what, what the whole fig tree deal, what, what that was all about. Son of man showing he is fully man. He became the son of man. You see that? He is the son of man, showing he is fully man, declaring, Jesus declaring that in order to get to heaven, you have to get there by means of of the son of man that's the lord jesus christ so he's fully god and fully man so when when jesus calls himself the son of man does he minimize himself no he doesn't that's just one side of jesus we need to understand it's dealing with the humanity of jesus christ when he's calling himself the son of god does that come on does that mean that he can't reach us because he's fully god no he's fully the son of god and fully the son of man all right, so Nathaniel said, right now, look, look at this, look at this. Thou art the king of Israel. Do you see that? He didn't say one day you'll be the king of Israel. He said, thou art the king of Israel. So Nathaniel is telling Jesus right now, Jesus was the king of Israel, even though Jesus was not practically and physically the king of Israel yet. So Nathaniel believed the promises of the future kingdom reside in Jesus Christ. He believes it. Come on. Do you guys remember back here? Look, Philip, 
Look at Philip. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him. Of whom what? Of whom what? Moses in the law and the prophets did write. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So look, Nathanael's responding to even what Philip said. He said, this is the one that's written of in the, the law and the prophets. This is Jesus of Nazareth. This is the rabbi, the son of God, the king of Israel. You know, he, he believed the promises of the future kingdom. He believed that those promises of the future kingdom reside in Jesus Christ. You know who else believed that too? You guys remember? Th think in the Bible. Who else believed that the promises of the future kingdom reside in Jesus Christ? Well, you'd be correct if you said the thief on the cross, Luke 23, 42. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. So the thief on the cross made the same declaration by faith that Jesus was the king of Israel and acknowledged the promises concerning the kingdom are entailed in Jesus Christ. Interesting, huh? Andrew, Philip, Nathaniel knew the Old Testament prophets said that when the Savior would come, it would be a man and not an army. It would be a king. Come on, a king would come to rule over Israel. It would be a man and not a movement. They knew the Old Testament taught the Messiah and this Messiah would be a king and he would be a man. So we're not looking for a movement. We're not looking for some rebellion. We're not looking for a group of, of individuals trying to overthrow the government. This would be one man, be one king, and he would be the Messiah. He would be that king. One man would do it, as was prophesied in the law and the prophets. Interesting. If he is God... He does not have to have an army. He doesn't even have to have a following if he doesn't, he doesn't need a following. He could take over everything all by himself. And if you really believe the prophets in the Old Testament, that's what they said. Look at Zechariah 4, 6. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Interesting. Look at Isaiah 31.1. Woe unto them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. See, Jesus don't need to trust in old chariots and old horsemen. That's what people do. Jesus can come by the spirit of his power. He'd take over the whole thing all by himself. <laughs> Amen. So it was never about a military exploitation when this prophecy would be fulfilled, but a stone that was cut without hands would come by his power. Look at Daniel 2.34. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and and clay and break them to pieces we're talking about those gentile nations those gentile all the gentile nations throughout all the the, the periods of time who's the woman that's going to come and take it all over all by his lonesome the stone that was cut without hands the lord jesus christ king of kings and lord of lords look daniel 245 that's your cross reference says the same exact thing oh friend it's jesus christ he doesn't need an army come on pe people looking for armies they're looking for movements they're looking for nations rising against nations i'm telling you when jesus comes he's going to come all by his lonesome self he's going to take over the whole thing as it was prophesied about in the old testament come on Come on, I'll give you another one here. Come on. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Now watch this. For unto us a child is born. Who's that child? Written 700 years before Jesus came. Who's that child? 
That child is the Lord Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, that's God with us. Unto us a son is given. Who's this son that was given? He's the only begotten son of God, John 3, 16. He's the only begotten son of God, um, 1 John 4, 9. And the government, you guys see that? People, people always miss this part. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Did he say the government shall be upon the movement that he's going to bring? The government shall be upon his, you know, all of his followers and all of his people that are going to come with their, with their chariots and their horses and their tanks and their, their Apache helicopters. <laughs> no, the government shall be upon his shoulder. That's the Lord Jesus Christ and his name shall be called. What? Wonderful. See the capital W there? That's deity. See the capital C there? Counselor? You got a lot of counselors in this world. But there's only one counselor that can truly counsel you, my friend. And he is the mighty God. Well, you know, there, there's a lowercase m there. That, that means, you know, he's the mighty God. But God the Father, Jehovah, you know, he's the mighty capital M God. Oh, well, well, let's look at, look at Isaiah 10. Now, now watch this. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll hit this. Now, now look. Um, look at verse 20. And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again say upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the what? You, who is that right there? That's Jehovah, right? Uh, Jehovah the Father, uh, the Holy One of Israel in truth. Now look at verse 21. The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto who? The mighty God. See the lowercase m there? The lowercase m is in reference to Jehovah the Father. Now go back to Isaiah 9, 6, okay? So that's a very lousy argument to say because there's a lowercase m there that somehow Jesus is... is uh... <laughs> oh, amen there, amen there. Yeah, uh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Uh, some great stuff to prove the deity of Jesus Christ, amen. So... um. So the mighty God, you see, guys, see that Jesus is the mighty God, Jehovah, the Father's the mighty God, and they're both lowercase m's. Okay, so that's a lousy argument to use, but a Jehovah Witness will certainly give you that argument. It's good to be ready for that, huh? The mighty God. Now look, the everlasting Father. See the now, now look. They say, well, Jehovah God the Father is the Father, but look, look what Jesus is called, the everlasting Father. Now, do you know the difference between everlasting and eternal? Everlasting means you have a starting point, and it, and it goes on for eternity. So everlasting has a starting point. Now what, is the, now, what does eternal mean? Eternal doesn't have a starting point or an ending point. So everlasting has a starting point. So you know what happened when Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins? There was a starting point for eternal life. Interesting, huh? Check, check this one out. This is interesting. God, God was never a man in eternity past. Come on. Through this child that is born, God now became a man. Remember Emmanuel, God with us? Come on. There's a starting point when Jesus became the son of God. He wasn't called Jesus in the Old Testament. He was called the eternal word. And he became the incarnated son. He incarnated a body of flesh. And so Jesus is the everlasting father of all them that would believe. You guys see that? So there is a difference of Jesus being the everlasting father and Jehovah God the father. You guys see that? You, you got to look at the differences there. And look, he's also called the prince of peace. The Prince of Peace. Now look at verse 7. Remember we're dealing with one man. One man would come to earth in his second coming. And he would take over all the kingdoms of the world. All by his lonesome self. Look at verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. 
the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. You guys see that? Isn't that neat? Jesus says in John 10, 30, I and my Father are one. In 1 John 5, 7, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the, the Father, the three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And they don't agree in one. They are one. Okay? So Isaiah 9, 7 says, look, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Who's doing all this work right here? Jesus Christ upon the throne of David, upon his. Who's, who's the his there? That's Jesus Christ, right? His kingdom to order it. Who's ordering it? That's Jesus Christ, right? And to establish it. Who's establishing it? That's Jesus Christ, right? With judgment and with justice. Who's doing that? That's Jesus Christ, right? From henceforth, even forever. Now watch this. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Who's the Lord of hosts right there? That's Jesus Christ. <laughs> that's the one that's being talked about, all, this child that is born, all the way to verse 7. Amen. Come on, guys. Get on board, little children. Get on board, little children. <laughs> come on. Get on board with this thing. Jesus is God. He's going to come back. Only God could do something like what Jesus is going to do in the second coming. He's going to come back. He's going to, his feet are going to touch the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is going to split in half. He's going to walk in through the gates. He's going to take the throne of David. Come on, friend. Armageddon, when that happens, there'll be a, a sword proceeding out of the Lord Jesus' mouth. Oh, friend, what great... What great news that this world will not continue on as, as it is in iniquity and in sin and in transgression, in, in guile and in deceit and lies and, and all of, the, all of the, the, the sinning and all of the stealing and theft and all of the, the dishonesty and all of the, the, the things people try to get away with in their lives. One day Jesus is coming back and he's going to put a stop to it and righteousness will be the kingdoms of the world because Jesus will rule with a rod of iron. Oh, friend, praise the Lord. Glory to God. See, when Jesus comes, he's going to do it all himself. He doesn't need me. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need anybody. Jesus is going to do it all. Look, you read Revelation 19 and 20. Jesus is going to do it all. Look, we're going to be coming back with him on those white horses. We're going to be there. But we're not going to lift a hand. Jesus is going to do it all. Oh, friend, one man shall take it over. He's not just an ordinary man. He's fully God and fully man. And this man, who had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God and is coming again. He's coming again. All oh, those great hymns, those great hymns of the faith. Oh, friend, I'm looking forward to that day. How about you? Uh, the rapture, when it comes to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, and wherever he is, there will we be also. When he comes back to earth, we'll be with him. If he goes somewhere else across the galaxy, we'll be with him. No matter where he is, we'll be there with him. Oh, friend, the fellowship we're going to have with him. All right, just some great... Uh, reminders, some great things that we covered today as we look to, took a look at Nathaniel and the fig tree. Imagine that. We're looking at the fig tree and we're talking about the millennial reign. <laughs> How about that? All right, guys. Uh, I didn't want to make this broadcast too long. I wanted to kind of just cover the fig tree a little bit and, uh, and I wanted to hit this part. I don't think we did hit this. And um, there's a lot of misunderstanding about the fig tree, okay? Now, there, there is some, something greater than being seen under the fig tree, and we mentioned that earlier. There is something greater than being part of the nation of Israel, because the fig tree represents the nation of Israel. And if you know, notice in the four Gospels, it's dealing with the spiritual condition of the nation of Israel when you look at that fig tree. Whenever Jesus Christ mentions that fig tree in a parable, he's speaking of the spiritual condition of the nation of Israel and, uh, and the fruit of that nation. 
And, but there are greater things are mentioned. Greater things are mentioned in the next verse. And we said we were going to cover that. But look, the fig tree in the Old Testament, we really didn't want to go there. But if you guys want those cross references, Judges 9, 9 10 to 11, 1 Kings 4, 25, 2 Kings 18, 31, Proverbs 27, 18, Song of Solomon 2, 13, Isaiah 3, 34, verse 4, Isaiah 36, 16, Jeremiah 8, 13, Hosea 9, 10, Joel 1, 7, Joel 1, 12, Joel 2.22, Micah 4.4, 4, Habakkuk 3.17, Haggai 2.19, Zechariah 3.10, Matthew 21.19-21, Matthew 24.32, Mark 11.13, Mark 11.20-21, Mark 13.28, Luke 13.6-7, Luke 2129, John 148, John 150, James 312, and Revelation 613. All truths about the fig tree, and it's all dealing with the nation of Israel and the different dispensations of their spiritual condition. You got to read the context to find out their spiritual condition. But nevertheless, the fig tree will always be Israel. Now let's talk a little bit about that. Um it represents the peace. Come on, in the Old Testament, it's mainly representing this fig tree. It's re representing the peace and prosperity of the nation of Israel, which is also a type of millennium or millennial reign. Malachi 4.4 4 and Zechariah 3.10, okay? Now, let's talk about the olive tree. What's the difference between the fig tree and the olive tree? Well, the olive tree typifies Israel in covenant relation with God, okay? So the olive tree is also Israel. We mentioned that. And it's dealing with the covenant relation with God. Deuteronomy 24.20, Judges 9.8-9, 9, 1 Kings 6.23, 1 Kings 31-33, Psalms 52.8, Isaiah 17.6, Isaiah 24, 13, Jeremiah 11, 16, Hosea 14, 6, Habakkuk 3, 17, Haggai 2, 19, Romans 11, 17, and Romans 11, 24, and James 3, 12. Okay, so we did a little bit about the olive tree, you know, it, and when you read that and study those verses, I mean, we don't have time to go through the, you know, the, the five trees in the, in the Bible, uh, and, and there's more trees mentioned, and we can, we can definitely get into some detail on the trees, but uh, that's not our goal today. We're mainly dealing with the fig tree, and I just wanted to show you maybe a little bit of study on other trees. It may uh, be able to help you deductively as you're studying the Bible, okay? So... We did the olive tree. Now, the vine tree. What is the vine tree in the Bible? You ready? I bet you won't guess what it is. What does the vine tree represent? Well, it's a vine tree, isn't it? It has vines. <laughs> now, the vine tree is also Israel. Okay, that's Numbers 6-4. And Ezekiel 15-2 and Ezekiel 15-6. So if you, you, you also got a cross reference to John 15, but Jesus Christ calls himself the true vine. You remember in John 15, verse one, I am the true vine because he is the vine that will help Israel to bear fruit if they would trust in him. But what's wrong with Israel? They're not trusting in their Messiah. So they have a corrupt vine. Okay, until they attach themselves to the true vine, they're just going to be wasted vine tree. <laughs> All right, so there you go, a little bit of that. Now, the wild olive tree, what is that? Well, hmm, olive tree, and that's Israel. No, no, hold on. I, I didn't say olive tree, I said wild olive tree. Hmm, so that's not Israel? Everything you said was Israel till now why are you changing it now brother ed okay well um not everything's israel remember that 
You got to read the context very carefully. The wild olive tree, Romans eleven seventeen. Now read Romans 11, the whole chapter very carefully. Okay. And then Romans eleven twenty four. we're dealing with the wild olive tree. That's dealing with Gentiles, Gentiles. Okay. Wild olive tree. Now let's talk about one more, one more tree. This is, this is your homework. You can study these on your own. The bramble, the bramble. What is the bramble? That is my friend. Is it Israel or is it the Gentiles? Is it the church? Nope. It's not the church. It's not Israel. It's the Gentiles again. So Judges 9:14 to 15, Luke 6:44, and you have Isaiah 34:13. Okay? So we did it. We've got five trees right there, three trees are the nation of Israel and different, come on, according to the context, you're getting a different side of Israel within these trees, okay? So you have the fig tree, Israel, the olive tree is Israel, the vine tree is Israel. Then you have the wild olive tree is Gentiles and the bramble is Gentiles, okay? So hopefully these, you know, these verses help you out to get a good uh, head start on studying and to help you to be able to study your Bible a little bit better, to have some understanding in the Word of God, how important that is for us, to be able to apply the Word of God to our lives better, not taking verses out of context or, or making a verse say something it doesn't say, but just to cross-reference the Bible with the Bible and uh, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Come on, let's do that. Let's do that, I, I guarantee you that if you just read your Bible and try to make it say what you want it to say, you'll get a whole different interpretation if you read the Bible in truth. Read the historical context, then apply the things in the Bible correctly when we're dealing with the church, okay? So hopefully these things are helpful to you. I'm, I'm, not, you know, I'm not on here trying to be Mr. Uh, you got to believe what the Bible says because I said it's that way. No, no I'm, I'm appealing to you. If you read the Bible in truth, you're going to come up with the same stuff I'm coming up with. But you got to be honest. You got to have integrity in the Bible. You got to study to show yourself approved unto God. I mean, you can't sit there and be lazy. Now, if you're walking around lazy and slothful, certainly you're not going to come up with a lot of the truths that I'm coming up with because you're not applying yourself. We're you know, A lot of times we're applying ourselves to football games, basketball games, stats of sports. Um, we're applying ourselves to our jobs and, and devoting our 24 hours a day to our jobs. Um, instead of your secular job, why don't you spend a little bit of time in the Bible? I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm telling you, it's going to help you spiritually. It's going to help you practically in your life every day as a Christian. Now, if you're not saved today, if you're not saved, Believe and trust that Christ died for your sins and rose again the third day. And if you trust and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of your soul, you would be saved from your sins. You'd be forgiven every sin. You'd have eternal life. Everlasting life. Come on, we, we talk about the difference between eternal and everlasting. We have them both. Everlasting life. And reconciliation to God, most important. Reconciliation to God. You can have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Ain't that great? Some great things right there. Uh, God has uh, very much uh, the greatest things to offer us as human beings. And why don't we trust in those things that God gives us uh, freely? Um, so I hope that you guys consider that. And if you're saved today, Read the Bible, study the Bible, go to church, pray, um, devote your life to the, to the things of the word of God, to go and preach the, the gospel to every creature, uh, support missionaries, to go overseas and tell other lost souls about Jesus Christ. Um, do those things. Um, those things are, it's only right for us to do that as Christians. It's not me telling you what to do. It's us trying to honor God in our lives. It's us loving God every day in our lives. Certainly, if we love God, 
the things that he asks us to do is the least we could do. So uh, praise the Lord for that. I'm going to do what I can do. I hope that you guys can do the same. Um, let's love Jesus Christ for what he's done for us, even giving us the very life that we have today. So I'm so thankful. I'm so grateful for what Jesus Christ has done for us and left us his word, this good old holy King James Bible, left us his eternal, pure, inspired, preserved word of God that we can go to and trust it and believe on it and be reassured and have the assurance of eternal security and eternal life and, and, and knowing that we can love him more every day. Oh, friend, I'm so thankful for that. I hope you are too if you're saved today. So I'm going to go ahead and let you guys go. I did stay on a little bit longer because I did want to just give some words of encouragement in the Bible. And I do thank you guys for joining me uh, this evening on KJV Bible Scope. And you can see a, a copy of these broadcasts on KJV Bible Scope YouTube channel. Okay? KJV Bible Scope YouTube channel. Um, you can go there, you can, uh, you know, uh, look at the playlists on there and you'll see these broadcasts uploaded to the YouTube channel where you can find all of these broadcasts in order, uh, to your, to your own discretion. You can watch those things, uh, into your supplement for your Bible studies. Okay. So I hope, I hope these studies will help you out. They've really helped me out a lot and just being able to study these things before I preach these things to you guys. And it's such a blessing to get in the word of God and just, uh, you know, reminisce on the things that I've learned in Bible school and just covering these things yet again, and just showing you, maybe even showing you different angles and different practical truths from these things. It should make it so much more interesting. So, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and let you go. Thank you guys for joining me on this KJV Bible Scope. And my name is Brother Ed, and may the Lord richly bless you guys. Y'all have a great, a great and wonderful evening.